Hello everyone and welcome to this session. My name is John Boylan and I'm the Professor of Business Analytics here at uh, Lancaster University and in this session I'm going to be joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Annalena Sachs and uh, Sven Corona, uh, to talk about different aspects of predictive analytics and forecasting. We're all members of the Research Centre for Market Analytics and Forecasting. It's one of our specialisms uh, here in the Department of Management Science and uh, we're really looking forward to telling you a little bit more about what we do. So without further ado, I will try and share with you my screen. Right, here we are. Well, I've just introduced the three people who are going to be taking part in this video. So I'll now move on to the first aspect we're going to look at. Now, I don't know if you've seen the TV programme Dragon's Den. The idea of it is that some entrepreneurs, there's two in this case, they pitch an idea to um, the so-called dragons. And these are people who may invest in their business idea if they think it's a good one. So let me give you an example and see what you think about this business idea. Let's suppose we're going to manufacture a whole range of products, but we're not going to worry too much about forecasting the demand. It's very likely we'll end up making and shipping lots of stuff that doesn't sell, and it'll go straight to landfill. There we are, that's the business idea. Would you invest? Well, I guess not. Now, you may think that's a slightly silly example that I'm deliberately exaggerating, but actually I'm not. Let's take this example, and this is a real example. If you actually analyse what happens to food as it goes through the whole supply chain, from those who make the food to the supermarkets and then to consumers, there is waste right throughout the chain. We're going to focus on one particular aspect of this, which is the waste that happens actually at the supermarket. Supermarkets end up buying things that don't sell and sometimes a lot of things that don't sell. And there's an example here and it's taken from a report from the independent newspaper back in February of this year. These are very large volumes, as you can see from uh, what it says there on the slide. So this is this is not a trivial issue. It's something that really needs to be given thought. And if we can actually forecast better, then surely we'll be able to do this. That's the basic idea. And that's what we're going to try and uh, focus on. So let me uh, ask you to put yourself in the shoes of a demand forecaster. And you can see the challenge there. The challenge is to forecast the demand for breakfast cereals uh, over the next three days. And why would we want to do that? Well, because we'd need to decide how much to order from our suppliers. Now, I'm not going to ask you how we're going to do that in detail, but I am going to ask you to think about what data would you ask for? Just give you a few moments to have a little think about that question. So what did you come up with? Well, let's think about some possibilities, shall we? One would be a recent history of sales of the different breakfast cereals. That would be useful to know. Perhaps also a recent history of any stockouts when uh, stock has simply not been available on the shelf. Maybe also a recent history of cereals going out of date and therefore having to be thrown away. That would be useful. Also, in a retail situation, maybe we can look at substitute products. So if the if the cereal is not available, perhaps people will go for porridge or something else instead. So we could maybe get some data on that. What else? Well, just think about the practical situation. When you're in a supermarket, very often things are on promotion and there's a buy one, get one free or 20 percent off. So if we had some information about that, that could be very helpful as well and could help us to predict if we're going to see extra demand in the next few days because that particular product is on promotion. Well, more on this subject later, Anna is going to talk to you about retail forecasting and how that can work. So I'll I'll pause on that and, and move on to, to, to other things. Suffice it to say that the methods can be quite simple, but they could also be very complex. And later Sven will be talking about the use of artificial intelligence and neural networks in, in forecasting and how this have really revolutionized the subject in recent decades. Now, let's think about a slightly different situation. Let's suppose you need to forecast um, the requirement for drugs 
in a hospital? Well, to begin with, it should be fairly clear that this is a similar problem to the one we've just thought about in terms of the breakfast cereals. It's similar because we're trying to forecast in relatively short term ahead, maybe a week, something like that, maybe slightly longer. And also we're looking for the demand of a particular product, so that's similar too. But then there's also differences. So for example, um, drugs don't tend to be on promotion. Another difference is that we actually know in a hospital that certain treatments are scheduled in advance. So some of the demand in advance is known and some isn't. So that's going to change the problem a little bit as well. So what, what this is telling us is that when we approach this subject, we can learn from previous examples, which may seem really very different, but actually maybe they're not so different, but also we need to adapt the models and change them to actually match the situation uh, that we're facing. And that's part of the challenge of our predictive analytics in general that we, we need to face. And it's a really interesting challenge. It's a, it's a fascinating challenge, actually. Now, it's all very well coming up with a forecast. And we could say, well, we're going to forecast a certain volume requirement of, of drugs, a particular drug. But we all know that the future is uncertain. So even if we can do this better than we've done it previously, and obviously we hope we can, our, our forecast will never be spot on. In fact, if somebody claims to say that they can forecast with perfect precision, then you actually know that they're fake. This is not a true expert in any sense of the word. What we should be doing is trying to quantify not just what we think will happen, but also maybe a range of possibilities so that it's not just an exact number that we will have that, but also a range around that. That can help us in our decisions. So in the drug case, we can try to make sure that, let's say, in 99% of occasions that the, the, the stock will always be available or even higher percentage. Uh, given the criticality of this particular application. And there's other really important applications that we can think of as well. One of the most difficult of all forecasting challenges is climate forecasting. Why is it so difficult? Well, because firstly, we're, we're forecasting way into the future. In this particular graph, we're actually trying to forecast 150 years into the future. But even if we don't try and go as far as that, nonetheless, trying to forecast 30 years or 50 years ahead is extremely difficult. And why? Well, because things depend. Things are going to depend upon what various governments do, what actions they take. And so what you can see in this graph here is um, within the, uh, the, 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 the dark grey band, this is the most likely occurrences, but we also have this really quite wide prediction interval which gets wider as we go further into the future. And this is good practice in forecasting that we can say not just what we expect, but also be honest about our, our lack of knowledge as well about what is going to happen into the future so that this can help decision makers to make sensible um, policy decisions as to what to do um, and the in the challenges that they face. In this particular application, you can see this global temperature anomaly. This is the difference between the temperature we expect and the uh, long term average. And you can see, and this possibly isn't surprising, that it is increasing. It's expected to increase steadily. This is work from one of our colleagues at Lancaster, Professor Peter Young, and you can see that he's modeled not just that, but also this really large uncertainty around those, those estimates. And of course, these estimates will change as we move through time and therefore can be used to guide us. Well, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to hand over now to uh, the first of my two colleagues, Anna Sachs, and she's going to talk about retail forecasting. And after that, we'll be handing over to Sven Krona, who will be talking uh, about machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I'll hand over to them now. Thank you, John. Welcome everybody also from my side. My name is Anna and I'm a lecturer in predictive analytics. So let's um, yeah, come back to the example that John just gave. Um, supermarkets throw away large amounts of food every year. This is not only a problem in the UK, this is um, everywhere in the world. Um, so what we usually do when we um, solve practical problems is that we try to put ourselves into the shoes of the decision makers. 
So we think about the type of the decisions that these people need to make and what kind of data they have available or what kind of data they could collect. And then we try to come up with a good solution. So in this example um, with the supermarket, we can assume that we are store managers. So we are all um, managing our own store. And in this store, we are carrying a large assortment. So we have many different types of products. And the problem is that we need to decide in advance how many items we want to have on our shelves. So we need to make that decision before demand occurs. And in order to make that decision, we usually use forecasts because we don't know how many customers are going to come to our store tomorrow, for example. But we want these customers to be able to buy um, the products that they are looking for. So we have to make this decision in advance and um, that's why we need a forecast. So let's take a look at um, how forecasting can help us to make um, these type of decisions and then hopefully to reduce food waste. So let's start with one of my favorite uh, products, which is chocolate. Um, of course, we want to make sure that our store doesn't run out of chocolate. So we should try to come up with a very good forecast of the demand that we are going to face. Um, so what we usually do is that we first start to look at some historical data to get a better understanding of what the demand for chocolate looks like. So in this example, we look at several weeks um, at the beginning of 2020. And um, you can see here um, on the y-axis, we have the sales and the x-axis, this is time. So these are the different weeks. And then the blue line is the sales that we observed during the time. So overall, you can see that there is some positive trend. So you can see that the demand increases over time. So maybe everybody just had too many sweets over Christmas and they are not so keen to buy more chocolate, but then at some point they return to previous habits and um, they eat more chocolate again. But then you can also see some spikes here. So there are some peaks in demand that occur at some points in time. And yeah, we don't know yet why these actually happen. So we would try to get more information or maybe we as a store manager know that something happens. So first of all, we would take the trend into account. So you can see here now the red line. So now we have a positive trend in our data. Um, then when we look at these um, sales observations a bit more closely, we can see that there is a repeating pattern every couple of weeks. And this is what we call seasonality. So by repeating that pattern over time, we can already um, predict demand much better. And um, then we would also try to find explanations of what happens at these peaks. Um, and these could be events like promotions that we ran during that time. And then we would also take them into account. And all this information helps us to make a better forecast and to take this into account in the future. Now let's take a look at another important product, which is ice cream. So at first sight, you might think that there is also a positive trend. But we as store managers, we know our customers quite well and um, we know that there are other causal relationships that might um, cause these kinds of ups and downs and the general um, yeah, pattern that looks like a trend. So something that usually comes to our mind rather quickly is price. So many customers are price sensitive, so they would buy less if the price of a product is high. So we can take price into account. So this is now the red line. Well, the forecast doesn't look very good yet. But since we're talking about ice cream, we could also think about considering weather. So we could take the temperature into account and we can see that this already helps a lot to better um, explain demand and to come up with a better forecast. In general, there are many other factors that we could take into account and they help us to come up with a better forecast and make better decisions um, in the future. 
What is just really important is that we understand the underlying structures in the data. So whether this is a time series structure, like a trend, or whether there are some causal effects. And all of this is information that we take into account when we come up with the forecast. OK, thank you. I'm going to hand over now to Sven, who is going to tell you more about other forecasting methods. Thanks, John. Thanks, Anna. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sven Kroner. I also work at Lancaster University together with my colleagues. And after learning a bit about the business problem um, of forecasting and the challenges, in particular in retail forecasting, I thought I'd give you a sneak peek how we solve that problem. And we we forecast future demand using algorithms. Algorithms, um, in general, algorithms are widely popular in mathematics and statistics, in computer science. Uh, JCP, an algorithm is just a sequence of instructions how to solve a particular uh, problem um, or to have, how to perform a particular computation. And we ha are developing and trying out algorithms from computer science, from statistics, from econometrics, um, in order to solve forecasting problems. And one particular class of algorithms is very much popular at the moment, and that is artificial intelligence. So let me talk a little bit about artificial intelligence with you. Um, basically, artificial intelligence is supposed to mimic the way um, that um, humans process information or uh, mammals process information. So it's kind of like replicating the brain. But how do we actually do that? And how can we use it for forecasting? Um, the whole hype about AI started with a computer being able to recognize a cat. Actually, it started a long time before, but it was actually in 2012, not too long ago, that, um, that Google trained 12, 16,000 computers on 10 million images. And at the end, the computer was able to recognize a cat. Doesn't sound very enticing, but if you think about it, um, in relationship to what people were able to do before with image recognition, this was a breakthrough. I mean, today we all know uh, your, your Apple iPhones can recognize your face and then unlock it. Um, there can be face recognition at doors. You can identify people going into secure areas, looking at face recognition. You can find uh, faces on photos. But at the time, this was a real breakthrough. And why is that a breakthrough? Why is it? Why is it? Because traditionally, we had developed algorithms in um, writing code. If then do this and else do that. Now, and that's really, really hard when you have something like an image. Like if the if the, the face is cute, that no, that doesn't work. I mean, both cats and dogs are cute and cats look very different. So how do we tackle this? Um, if the owl's eyes are round and they're not far away from the nose. So it was really, really hard to do this with conventional computer technology. And what they did really in the end is they developed an artificial neural network, sometimes called the deep neural network, in which they digitize the image um, that contains a cat, and then you process it in a similar way that the brain does it. Lots of simple processing units, heavily interconnected, and not learning by programming or design or rules, but actually by learning, learning true and false, learning by making mistakes. And that's what they did. In a simple ex example, um, optical character recognition, right? just to re recognize a handwritten digit was a really big application area, particularly for the post offices in the 1980s and 90s. What they did is they, um, they, they took a little picture down here, like the aid, and they digitized it. It basically means they take, uh, um, you know, they take the image and they put a box around it, 28 by 28 pixels, and each pixel has a color, and the color um, basically gets a number. So if the color, for example, this is inverted, so white became black, and um, then all the black dots basically have a value of zero, as you can see in the big matrix next to it. So all the black values get a zero, and all the light and uh, lighter values, you know, the gray and the white ones, actually get a, a number until it's pure white, which is 255. That's the, the brightest one. And so basically, we now have digitized this handwritten digit into a matrix of 28 by 28 pixels, which is 784 pixels. And these are actually the numbers that are fed into a neural network. And then we learn, right? Because we have an expert that says this is actually an eight. Okay, so we learn. We have the image on the one hand side, and we have the true class membership on the right hand side, which is an eight. And then we are trying to reduce the error of the algorithm by using some fancy mathematical uh, um, 
uh, approach called backpropagation using the chain rule of partial derivatives. That sounds complicated, doesn't it? We don't have to really understand it, but we adjust the weights, we adjust the parameters of the algorithm so that the next time it sees an eight, it makes less of a mistake. And then you showed a different picture. You showed a three, and then maybe you showed an eight again, and you showed a different three, and a three for, written from by a different person. And in the end, it will have learned to distinguish a three from an eight, which is kind of hard because, you know, the three also is kind of like round on one side and the eight is on both sides. So, um, so that's the thing. And then with more compute power, with more data being available, we were able to expand this from optical character recognition to cats and dogs. And um, so it basically trains on pictures. We don't need to create any code. We just create lots and lots of examples which exist on the internet these days. And then we train a neural network and it can learn to recognize a cat or a dog. Just to give you an example, this is a simple example of how it recognizes a dog, right? And you can see that the image, this is actually live on YouTube, um, so you can rewatch it there if you want to. And the algorithm actually says, I'm 100% sure this is a dog. I'm 64% sure this is a dog. This, I'm 99.97% sure this is a cat. And you can see that the pictures are all different. It's a complete cat, but um, it's a complete dog, but with a leash and a hand in it that doesn't confuse the algorithm. It's two cats, right? It doesn't say that. It's it's a dog um, sitting in different backgrounds. It's partially obstructed dogs. This really was uh, um, a breakthrough in image recognition that we were able to train something, mimicking the human brain, uh, creating an algorithm in a computer that was able to solve the same problem. And um, so you can see that there is recognizing most of these cats quite accurately after being trained on them. So that's really quite amazing. If you want to, you can watch the whole video online. But in a business environment, this is even more exciting because we can actually train it on not just cats and dogs. We can train on lots of images and it will then recognize cars and trucks and people, uh, traffic cameras. Um, it will recognize bicycles, right? So you actually get a surrounding and already you can see that there are applications for this in autonomous driving or you know having automatic braking assistance and, and other areas as well. So really, really understanding images and the film is just a set of images. So if your computer is fast enough, you can also recognize film and uh, moving images. Quite popular. And um, of course, that helps with lots of applications. But for forecasting, we can also use it. We take a time series, which basically, if you visualize it, is a picture. And then we cut it up in lots of overlying little pictures. And we train it. And the input is actually the historical picture of the past, let's say, ice cream sales or beer sales of the last 12 months in a retail shop. And then the output is the picture of the beer sales or the ice cream sales or whatever the output is um, for the next five or six months, right? And you can then, the neural network learns the input-output mapping in a supervised learning kind of way between an input pic picture and an output picture, and it can learn forecasting. Right, really cool stuff. And this is just an example to show you that this is a neural network. And if we um, actually train the neural network, you can see at first it guesses around a little bit. And now I'm going to speed this up a little bit so that um, it's running automatically. And now you can see, well, at first it, it, it tries to get the level right. And then it, it says, oh, OK, there's a trend. So it starts to learn the trend. It's doing that by looking at lots of input pictures of just the last 13 observations, last months and then try to predict the next observation and uh, it basically shows you um, it's learning on the blue part and instead predicting the yellow and the green part which it never sees for learning so it's able to not only to approximate things in the past but also to generalize into the future as well and if we keep let this run for for a long time then you can see it actually perfectly almost perfectly learns the relationship um on the left hand side here you see the error in learning being reduced right you can see the distribution of the errors really getting much, much better now, but it's an iterative process. But I've slowed this down. Normally when we run this, uh, this actually completes in the fraction of a millisecond. But then of course we couldn't watch the neural network learn. So I've just slowed this down for us. Okay, so that's basically how a neural network learns. It's just same uh, technology, the same type of algorithms that you have in your mobile phone that Google uses, Facebook uses, and others. And we don't only, we can't only use single time series, but if uh, looking at Anna's example and, and John's examples from the supermarkets, we may have many, many variables. So we may have, you know, this is a project we did with Tesco uh, with our master students, and we had to predict lettuce sales in supermarkets. And 
we not only used past sales, but we also created pictures of past prices, calendar effects like bank holidays, temperature, sunshine, weather effects. And then we're getting a much richer picture that we can digitize and then feed to the network. And of course, we can actually do this for all the 1,000 locations of Tesco and all 40,000 items. And uh, so it becomes a big problem and a big project. But this is just an example, beer forecasting. Uh, this is a new network that's actually learned how to forecast beer. The blue is the actual beer sales, and the red is a prediction of beer sales using prices, weather information, lots of variables. As you can see, the variables are interacting with each other, weather, um, prices, promotions. And then we compare this to statistical algorithms and even to a human expert trying to make predictions. And the neural network did indeed achieve superhuman accuracy, right? So we trained a neural network on the data that we have in retailers, and it was in the end better forecasting this than a human. But to be fair to the human, he has to forecast hundreds of these time series in a very short period of time. And the neural network and an algorithm on a computer never gets tired. So that's all I wanted to share with you, just to give you a flavor for how to create an algorithm. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at Lancaster at some point. Bye. Thanks, Dan. That was really interesting. And isn't it great how much uh, machine learning is now actually really taking our field further forward and uh, giving us some new insights into how to best predict um, demand and indeed other things as well. I just want to conclude with some comments, not just about what we do in predictive analytics, but also um, about how predictive analytics fits in analytics as a whole. I've just shared with you a screen and you can see here that there's at least three aspects of analytics which are important. The first, and indeed before we can do any of the things we've been talking about, is to just understand what the data is telling us, what it means, what the patterns have been. That can be done by a human, it can be done automatically as we've just heard. Then we come on to what we've been talking about, which is predictive analytics, being able to look into the future. But I want to stress that this is a foundation actually for all of the decision making that we need to make because all decision making is by definition about the future. So I'm hoping very much you've enjoyed this session and it will form a good basis for the other sessions that you are due to uh, enjoy during during these uh, these days. So thanks very much for your attention and uh, very much hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions. Goodbye.